distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, and students. Uh, my name is Stuart Elborn. I'm the Provost and Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, of this wonderful university. And it's my privilege to welcome you here tonight to this very special event. Uh, and in particular, uh, to welcome our guest of honour, uh, Mr. Alban Curti, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Kosovo. You're hugely welcome and thank you very much for coming to visit Northern Ireland today and especially uh, to visit Queen's. Uh, in Queen's uh, University, it's our mission to educate, uh, to research and to innovate to ensure we have a flourishing society. Universities uh, today are rightly and increasingly seen as anchor institutions with a responsibility to ensure that they have a positive impact on their neighbourhood, local and global. And I think in the light of tonight's discussions, the opportunity to bring together uh, two regions where uh, there has been local and global impact and the learnings we can have from each other is really important. So at Queen's, our, our mission is to be that civic anchor. It's really at the heart of what we do. Uh, it's why we educate, why we research, and why we innovate. We're delighted to have this opportunity to provide a platform for public discussion on challenges and opportunities for state building in a region that for all the differences has many similarities to our own post-conflict situation. Queen's has played a significant role in our peace process here in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, institution building has been part of uh, our ambition in Northern Ireland. So like uh, Prime Minister Curti, who I understand was a, a former student union president uh, in the University of Pristina, many of Northern Ireland's political leaders started their careers through uh, the student union here at Queen's. Uh, and indeed, we have one of our ex-presidents uh, uh, here in the audience. And these include uh, many of the architects of the uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement, now recognised as one of the world's most successful peace accords. This included Nobel, uh, notable figures such as the Nobel Prize winner uh, and Ulster Unionist leader David Trimble, uh, whose portrait hangs in this hall, uh, and who became the first uh, First Minister uh, of Northern Ireland. Another former Queen student, Mark Durkin, uh, succeeded uh, tr uh, David Trimble's fellow laureate, uh, John Hume, as the leader of the Social Democratic and Labour Party uh, and became the Deputy First Minister. Uh, Mark, indeed, was at Queen's during the same time as, as I, uh, and uh, we both sat together on Student Council uh, at that time, and he uh, had a journey into politics and had huge impact uh, for which I'm proud to know him for and have had the great privilege of working with him at that time. At Queen's, uh, during those uh, uh, periods of conflict uh, in the 70s, 80s and early 90s uh, was a safe environment for which uh, I am personally very uh, grateful uh, and it continues to provide that safe environment uh, for political leaders to have difficult and challenging discussions and conversations uh, around the important area of peace building. Uh, in 2018 and 2023, we marked the 20th and 25th anniversaries of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, hosting uh, its architects and many current world leaders, uh, and most notably, uh, Senator George Mitchell, whose bust is uh, in the uh, gardens at the front opposite the uh, Whitla Hall uh, and whose without tireless efforts the, the agreement may not have been possible. No doubt uh, Prime Minister Curti will agree that uh, building institutions in the wake uh, of conflict is a long and difficult process with many setbacks but with optimism and persistence uh, this can be achieved. And to quote uh, Senator Mitchell himself who was uh, uh, quoting in part uh, W.E.B. Yeats, one of our uh, Nobel uh, poets from Ireland, peace may come droppingly slowly, but when it comes, it confirms the humanity in all of us. 
So thank you again, uh, Prime Minister, and your team for coming. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to uh, invite uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Chris Heaton Harris, who uh, has not only had a successful career in politics, but I uh, picked up in the conversations earlier, he's also been a successful uh, uh, football referee, uh, and perhaps there are many parallels as we're thinking of parallels tonight in, in those roles. Uh, Chris has uh, uh, helped uh, navigate the most uh, difficult of the last uh, decades of years, uh, and uh, we're delighted uh, to have him tonight uh, to join in this lecture and uh, to introduce our special guest. So you're very welcome again, Chris to Queen's, uh, and thank you for coming and can I invite you to the podium. Uh, thank you, Stuart, for, for that. And um, I think there's no such thing as a successful football referee, so uh, at least not in uh, popular culture. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, distinguished guests, Prime Minister Curti, um, it's an honour to be here on this very important evening to welcome you, Prime Minister, to Northern Ireland and to the beautiful surroundings of Queen's University. I bring with me uh, best wishes from both my Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, Lord Cameron, um, who wishes you well on your visit. The friendship between the United Kingdom and Kosovo is a long-standing one. Indeed, we were the first nation to recognize Kosovo's independence in 2008, and we continue to be proud supporters of the sovereignty and territorial integrity. We take our role in supporting Kosovo in the challenges it, f it faces very seriously. Be that through our troops in NATO in providing support to tackle organized crime and corruption, or the work carried out by our diplomats. And I welcome our ambassador to Kosovo, uh, Nick, here this evening, um, to help preserve the peace through work on transitional justice, reconciliation and integration, and support the EU-facilitated dialogue. We stand with you, Prime Minister. I was delighted when I received the news that Prime Minister Curti would visit this part of the United Kingdom that not only shares many parallels, although I don't like that word much, with Kosovo's painful past, but also shares in many of its hopes for the future. Now I know we use the word parallels and people draw parallels between Northern Ireland and other areas of the world recently affected by conflict. But there are no real true parallels with what happened here in Northern Ireland. But there are always, always, lessons to be learnt in both directions. Here we've found, are still finding, that reconciliation is really, really hard. It takes a really long time. There's no one-size-fits-all solution to any of the problems. And there will always be people who, for legitimate reasons, simply cannot bring themselves to a point of reconciliation at all. But overall, for communities and for most people, reconciliation can be reached. But it does require tough choices, bravery, uncomfortable decisions, huge amounts of dialogue, lots of that behind closed doors where people can't see. It requires patience and leadership. Um, Prime Minister, most recently I've seen you described as charismatic and unrelenting. I see these as two excellent traits in a leader. Northern Ireland has made some of its greatest leaps forward under the leadership of charismatic and unrelenting people. Indeed, Northern Ireland has transformed itself in the last 25 years under charismatic and unrelenting leadership. And this hasn't happened by itself because it's been with Northern Ireland, because of Northern Ireland's people, people who every day commit themselves to try and reconcile and work together to build a better and more peaceful future. Now this in itself is not without its challenges. Northern Ireland is a society uh, that is rebuilding relationships and trust in the aftermath of decades of violent conflict. And this legacy looms large and for many is deeply personal. Indeed, how we would deal with this legacy dominates the news agenda here tonight. 
It is my sincere hope that this visit will help facilitate a, a meaningful sharing of experiences and leave you with a lasting and loving impression of the, uh, Northern Ireland and the courageous peacekeepers that it brought. And so, this evening, I look forward to hearing of the Prime Minister's vision for Kosovo and what we can learn from you, Prime Minister, and the people you represent. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honour to introduce to you the Prime Minister of Kosovo, Albin Kurti. Secretary of State Heaton Harris, Provost Elborn, Professor Hughes, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly an honor to have the opportunity to address you today and to be in Belfast. I do not take it for granted how special it is to visit this place for the first time. While I'm not an academic by training, I believe I am uh, pretty well equipped discuss today's topic because I've spent the entirety of my life working on it. I've been alternately torn and put together again in trying both to practice some of the theories I've read and to theorize some of the experiences I've undergone. In the past days I've thought a lot about Northern Ireland and inevitably how the story weaves with that of Kosovo. I believe the overarching theme is the power of hope as a catalyst for transformation. Through my experiences, I've come to understand just how profound this transformation can be, and Belfast as well. Belfast's current status as the second fastest growing knowledge economy in the United Kingdom following London represents a significant departure from its past. In a similar vein, I've found that every guest I've hosted, whether they've reported on or visited Kosovo during the war or in its aftermath, has been astounded by the remarkable transformation the country has gone through. Pristina, like Belfast, stands as a vibrant and thriving city amidst this remarkable evolution. And Pristina, like Belfast, is fast becoming a tech-driven city. I firmly believe that all our achievements in the end are because of the relentless hope of our people and their insatiable drive to make progress. It's truly striking to consider that both here and in Kosovo, conflict once dominated every aspect of daily life. So change is possible and peace is possible too. This comparison draws attention to another noteworthy aspect. Both Northern Ireland and Kosovo during this time are marking important 25 years milestones. Northern Ireland recently celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, while Kosovo will commemorate the 25th anniversary of its liberation this June. 25 years is important because it offers perspective while maintaining a sense of relevance and engagement with ongoing issues. Now, 25 years after the NATO intervention, it's only natural that we find ourselves entering a new phase of growth for our country. The first 25 years in Kosovo were dedicated to laying the groundwork for independence and then putting that independence in action. This involved establishing and fine-tuning domestic institutions, a process akin to weaving a delicate web that requires constant adjustment. Additionally, on an international scale, it entails securing recognition of our right to exist in the first place. On February 17, 2008, we officially declared our independence as a sovereign state. But it, was, it wasn't until more than two years later, on July 22, 2010, that our statehood was confirmed by the International Court of Justice. The Court's landmark advisory opinion was issued in response to a request initiated by Serbia itself at the UN General Assembly. 
but Serbia, Serbia's move backfired, as the court's resulting opinion explicitly concluded that Kosovo's declaration of independence did not violate international law. The achievements of our country have not been without other major trials as well, the most formidable of which is the constant struggle to nurture and preserve the hope of our people. There have been periods in Kosovo's recent history where that hope risked being extinguished, with corruption emerging as the foremost threat. However, in 2019, when our government won our first election, we showed how enduring that hope is. People yearned for change and they received it. They welcomed a government that not only represented youth in age, but also embodied a fresh perspective and innovative thinking. So, in my opinion, democracy is the best system of government through which this hope is kept alive. At times, left-leaning governments are criticized due to their lack of emphasis on uh, identitarian values. Indeed, democracy can sometimes appear dry and devoid of feeling when compared to the emotional heights of liberation or independence, or even the alluring propaganda of an authoritarian regime or a fascist dictator. However, good governance relies on everyday routine. Life's excitement shouldn't come from wondering if public services will work or if human rights will be respected. Governance should be steady, making small improvements over time, a rising tide that lifts all boats and leaves no citizen behind. The era we are stepping into is not solely about establishing institutions. It's also about constructing institutions that offer robust social support for the people. It's about creating a framework where individuals feel served and protected by the state. I am the leader of a social democratic party and as a prime minister, I have attempted to govern according to social democratic principles. This has meant taking seriously both the social and the democratic elements of that formula. Indeed, our government has shown how socioeconomic advancement and democratic progress go hand in hand, not a development without democracy or the other way around. The growing success of Kosovo's democratic reforms has been independently documented. Since we took office three years ago, we've improved 21 places in Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, and we've moved up 22 places in Reporters Without Borders Media Freedom Index. We are the first in the Western Balkans, second in Europe, and third in the world for improvement in civil and political rights, according to Freedom House, as well as first in the Western Balkans in the VDEM Institute's Electoral Democracy Index. In 2022, the World Justice Project ranked Kosovo second in the entire world for greatest improvement in rule of law, even as most countries suffered declines. On the socioeconomic side of the equation, our uh, democratic reforms have been accompanied by substantial increases in prosperity and wealth widely distributed across our society. Over the past three years, we've increased our budget by 35%, with the greatest benefits going to the most disadvantaged citizens. In particular, we have introduced neonatal and child care subsidies, made public higher education free of charge, improved housing conditions for ethnic minority communities, increased pensions for persons with disabilities, and provided private sector incentives to boost employment among women and youth. According to the World Bank, Kosovo has provided the most generous aid package in Western Balkans as a percentage of GDP to help citizens cope with the global energy and cost of living crisis. 
FDI has doubled in the past three years, likewise exports, while our trade deficit has shrunk by a third. And importantly, our progressive social democratic agenda has not been bankrolled by unsustainable spending. To the contrary, the 35% increase in our budget since 2021 has been powered forward by a two-thirds increase in tax revenues over the same period without changes in fiscal policy. I guess when people see that there is no corruption in the government, they are more ready to contribute and pay taxes and eliminate gray economy. And when people are hopeful, they rather spend than save, which is good for their lives and overall economy. This has resulted in our public debt last year dropping to a historic low of 17% of GDP, lower than any current EU country. For my government, being true to our principles means more than promoting justice and equality within our borders, but beyond them as well. The Republic of Kosovo seeks not only to be recognized by the international community, but also to be an active contributor to addressing the major challenges that the world currently faces. Our determination to be a responsible member of the world community is perhaps most evident in the context of climate change. Kosovo has not been, either historically or presently, a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, and yet we have demonstrated a firm commitment to a green transition and climate mitigation. This is despite the fact that we sit on the world's fifth largest and Europe's second largest reserves of lignite. Last month, we completed our first 100 megawatt solar auction with a number of further auctions in the pipeline for future solar and wind projects. With EU funding, we have subsidized families and businesses to take steps to reduce their energy use. We reward those who save. With support from European Union, World Bank, and European Bank of, for Reconstruction and Development, we have improved the energy efficiency of public buildings. And we have an ambitious agenda of green infrastructure projects that will significantly reduce our aggregate emissions. One such project, for example, is the Pristina Duras Highway. This, uh, sorry, railway. This railway will link the nearest port to our capital city, thereby drastically reducing emissions from trucks and other automobiles used for the transport of goods going through current highway that we have. We are in the process of soliciting international loans and grants to contribute to this project and others like it together with our government. Of course, the greatest duty that any country has under international law is that of peace. As you know yourselves, peaceful and good neighborly relations are not always easy. In the case of Kosovo and Serbia, such relations are made especially difficult by the fact that a mere 25 years have passed since Slobodan Milosevic's era of brutal repression, which culminated in war and genocide against our people. But we in Kosovo have not given up. As I stated last month in my address to the United Nations Security Council, we must come to terms with what has happened in the past, but we absolutely do not seek to avenge it. Justice is justice by not being revenge. Our desire for peace is exemplified by a basic agreement we reached with Serbia almost exactly one year ago on February 27th last year in Brussels in a process facilitated by the European Union and supported by the United States. The basic agreement is modeled, is, uh, modeled after the 1972 basic treaty between East and West Germany, back then former German Chancellor Willy Brandt, Ostpolitik, live and let live, mutual de facto recognition between two Germanies, 
which preceded seats in UN for both Germanys uh, in September 1973. It expressly invokes the UN Charter as the guiding light governing the relations between our countries. As such, it is founded upon the fundamental ideal of peace between sovereign nations. Unfortunately, ever since we reached the agreement, the basic treaty, Serbia immediately started backing away from it and has even refused to sign it. At least eight out of 11 articles of basic agreement have been violated by Serbia. And unfortunately, the facilitators, the mediators in Brussels, who were supposed to be referees, did not blow the whistle when they noticed a breach. And uh, ultimately, Prime Minister of Serbia, Madam Anna Brnabic, sent a letter to the European Union on December 13, stating that the agreement isn't legally binding. Most Ominously, that same letter states that Serbia refuses to respect Kosovo's territorial integrity, thereby reserving the right essentially to invade our country at will. So we have reached the agreement. President of Serbia said yes in order not to sign. And now he has this buyer's remorse of regretting for saying yes. It is not easy to remain supportive of an agreement when the other party continuously violates, denigrates, and repudiates it. It is even more difficult to keep faith in the prospects of peace and good neighborly relations with a country that refuses even to recognize our existence and sponsors criminal and terrorist gangs operating on our territory. But we in Kosovo have an unshakable core of optimism. We can never and will never give up hope. The fact that we have not abandoned the agreement despite Serbia's repeated attempts to undermine it is a testament to our ironclad commitment to peace with Serbia and with all the world states. It is also a testament to how highly we value our partnership with the European Union and the United States. In the end, the security of Kosovo is not only a national priority, but also a European one. Two years have passed since the war in Ukraine began. Countless innocent lives have been lost, with six million refugees fleeing the country and millions more internally displaced. This tragic event has underscored that Russia's authoritarianism poses a tangible, not merely theoretical threat. For too long, Europe has operated under the belief that any escalation of this threat would not involve violent conflict. However, we must adapt our politics to the realities of the threats we face. Kosovo and the surrounding region are particularly vulnerable to Russia's influence, primarily due to Serbia's close alliance with Russia. Serbia is the only European country besides Belarus, not to impose sanctions on Russia's Federation. And it maintains deep economic and uh, political ties with the country. Last Parliament of Serbia, out of 250 MPs, 99, almost 40%, were belonging to the friendship group Serbia-Russia. We have parliamentarian friendship groups with all the countries that recognized us, and at most a dozen of MPs are members, but not 99 in any case. Since uh, I started with hope, I'd like to finish with that idea as well. Hope is indeed a powerful force, but uh, it must be nurtured and maintained. Hope means work, means labor, means 
engagement and commitment. Within a country, the preservation of hope is upheld through democracy. It hinges on ensuring that people have faith that their contributions to the state will yield meaningful outcomes. It entails fostering an ongoing dialogue between citizens and the state rather than erecting barriers that isolate government from its people. At a regional and continental level, hope is sustained through partnerships and alignment. This, emphasis, this emphasizes the importance of equal and reciprocal relationship between states. Those who are dedicated to building, safeguarding, and advancing democracies must not be left feeling isolated. The sense of being excluded despite sustained efforts is profoundly damaging to hope. In Kosovo, the prolonged wait for Schengen visa liberalization exemplified this sentiment. Despite having fulfilled the criteria long ago, Kosovo took significantly longer to receive liberalization compared to neighboring countries. We had 95 criteria to fulfill in comparison to around 40 that were put for Albania, Montenegro, or North Macedonia. Liberalization finally came into effect on January 1st of this year, but our journey towards European Union integration must not repeat this over-lengthly wait. Countries committed to nurturing democracies despite facing visible challenges must feel included in the broader community of nations. And we want to join both European Union and NATO and Council of Europe, not simply to benefit, but also to contribute. We are no longer confronting merely theoretical threats. The rise of the far right poses a tangible dan danger, and violence remains a pressing concern. Our actions must rise to the occasion and respond forcefully to these grave challenges. Only then can we keep hope alive and turn that hope into our new reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister Kurti, um, for your really interesting talk outlining some of the very positive developments in Kosovo and also some of the, the very real challenges that remain. Um, we will have some time for questions, um, but just to give people a little time to absorb your words and to think about what questions they might want to ask, um, I would just like to add my own personal thanks um, that you and your team have made this trip to Northern Ireland and that we have been able to share with you some of our efforts to build peace in this conflict society, post-conflict society. Um, as you know, we in the Centre for Shared Education here at Queen's have a long-standing relationship with your country. And for the last few years, we have been delighted to host Dr. Adona Maluku, um, former Deputy Minister of Education in Kosovo, um, as a Social Change Initiative Fellow in the Centre for Shared Education. Not only has it been a delight to work with Adona, but I'm pleased to, to report that we've become the best of friends. <laughs> um, in our work together over almost a decade, um, and that of centre colleagues, we've led delegations both to Kosovo from Northern Ireland and from Kosovo to Northern Ireland, connecting colleagues from across different sectors in both jurisdictions, including academics, policymakers, school leaders, politicians and NGOs all of whom share a commitment to peace building through our school system and to share an understanding that we do that best and most sustainably when we work collaboratively across sectors. As you mentioned and others have mentioned, there are obvious parallels between Kosovo and Northern Ireland. Both are transitioning societies with a history of violent conflict, comprising divided groups with different political and national aspirations. And as you will know from your own context, and as we know from our stuttering efforts to achieve political stability here, peace is often hard won. 
I hope what you've witnessed during your visit to the Nettlefield St Matthews Partnership earlier today, schools that are located on an interface between two of the most divided and disadvantaged communities in Belfast, is the power of ordinary people, parents, teachers, young people, to make a difference and to challenge the sometimes received wisdom in divided societies that separate is better. The evidential power of shared education is that it allows for systemic integration whilst not threatening strong attachment to separate identities and the right for parents to choose a preferred school type. Balancing that parent's right to choose against the role of a separate education uh, experience that that might play in perpetuating hostilities is one that I know resonates in your own country. And we look forward to our ongoing collaborations as we seek to work collectively towards something better for all our children and young people that can tackle the legacy of division and conflict they inherited. So thank you for your talk and thank you for your visit. Um, I hope by now everyone's had a chance to mull over Prime Minister Curdie's words. Um, and if you'd like to join me here, um, please, uh, if you would just raise a hand if you have a question. Prime Minister, thank you for the overview of your um, country's development over the past decades. Um, I think here in Northern Ireland we've come to appreciate the challenges that state building um, um, faces, particularly if there is limited recognition of your statehood overall at the international scene. <coughs> but um, what I would like to hear more from you about is how would you think of um, opportunities that your country has now in the changing geopolitical realities with the war happening in, uh, in the east of Europe, the uncertainty of presidential elections in, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. What are the challenges and opportunities that you see for, for your ruling party in Kosovo, for Vetvin Dossi? Thank you. Sorry, I, we, we find it difficult to hear your question. Could you maybe come forward and ask? Sorry. Should I speak up maybe like this? Yes, that's very easier. <clears throat> I'll use my lecture voice. And, um, <laughs> Prime Minister, thank you again. So I hope you can hear the discussion now. Um, we appreciate the challenges that state building um, is uh, bringing to political leadership, especially when there is limited recognition of statehood. Um, for your country, for other countries, for political movements across Europe. What are the uh, challenges and maybe opportunities that you envisage for Kosovo, led by Vetvin Dossi particularly, now that we are in a changing geopolitical constellation with the war happening in Europe, on the European continent now on one side, and the uncertainty of commitment to democracy in North America, the, your key ally. Thank you. I think since that's such a significant question, we will address that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kosovo is recognized by 22 out of 27 EU members, by 26 out of 30 NATO members, by uh, 34 out of 46 Council of Europe members, and by 117 members of United Nations. All of G7 countries recognize Kosovo. Um, we want to increase the number of international organizations where we are members, but also bilateral relations to establish with as many countries as possible to reach uh, universal recognition one day soon. Uh, we have joined from early on all sanctions of uh, EU, US, and UK against the uh, Russian Federation. And we have no dilemmas regarding our orientation. We believe that uh, values and interests are not identic, are not the same thing, yet they should not be decoupled. That's why, in terms of economic development, we count and already are witnessing uh, tendencies for uh, business process outsourcing, for nearshoring, even for friendly shoring of uh, different corporations, of uh, 
a democratic West, so to speak, into uh, our country. Regarding uh, Russian Federation, we should help Ukraine with everything uh, we can and know in order to come out victorious from this war. It is not going to be easy because uh, despotic President Putin is both bitter and nostalgic. And there is no worse combination than this. Uh, there are similarities between Russian Federation and Serbia because Russian Federation came out of disintegration of former Soviet Union, which imploded, bringing sort of a big octopus. Russian Federation at the center with tentacles all around its neighborhood in the form of satellite parastates. Also implosion of uh, Yugoslav Federation brought Serbia in the center with its tentacles, not like a big octopus, but like a small quadripus. Uh, Republika Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina, parallel structures in uh, neighboring countries, and then uh, Serbian Orthodox Church being very prominent. So I have no illusions. It's not going to be easy. However, we should have more solidarity. Uh, those who adhere to democracy, rule of law, human rights, political pluralism, and I have great hopes that this has already started. I think we can do better and more, but I must acknowledge that the reputation of Kosovo and the connections of Kosovo, for example, with uh, G7 countries, have increased since uh, a Russian invasion in Ukraine. And the last thing I would like to mention is the fact that we have to invest more in our military and security capacities and capabilities. So the critique that we have been witnessing uh, recently, which country is giving 2% of its GDP for its defense, does not relate to Republic of Kosovo because we have already reached 2% of GDP for our uh, military. And um, unfortunately, instead of spending this money for healthcare, education, infrastructure, and so on and so forth, we have to spend it for defense and security. But on the other hand, if we are not secure, and if we cannot defend ourselves individually, and especially collectively, uh, the democracies, every kind of progress becomes utterly fragile. So this is one new thing that is coming about as a priority for our country and for which we count and uh, are building new levels of cooperation with our friends, partners and allies, EU, US and UK. Is there a question over here? Thank you. Could you hear okay? Yes. 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 Uh, so thank you for, so much for speaking. Um, in terms of peace, achieving peace is one thing, but keeping peace is another challenge. Uh, so what challenges have you faced with public reconciliation post peace accords? Well, if we use this uh, trinity of peacekeeping, peace building, peacemaking, NATO intervened in March 1999 to stop genocides of uh, Milosevic military and police forces in Kosovo. And then we had peacekeeping forces. After liberation, we got peace. Liberation Day of Kosovo is the same as Peace Day, 12th of June, 1999. Peacekeeping forces are still there, but not in large numbers like 25 years ago. 
uh, it's around 12% of what we used to have 25 years ago. And our defense and security capacities are increasing. So when it comes to peacekeeping, I cannot avoid the hardware. Hardware must be there. But then there is software as well. And that has to do a lot with uh, peace building, where peace is labor. You have to work every day. And that has a lot to do with combating hybrid war, whose source is generally in Kremlin, and its regional Sputnik base in Belgrade. So fake news, fake historical narratives, are something that we are challenged every day. This coupled with cybersecurity of our system across the board is something which uh, on one hand represents our contribution to peace building because we increase our resilience, we increase our immunity, but uh, at the same time is the software aspect of peacekeeping which is being conducted by our troops, but especially NATO uh, troops in Kosovo. And not only, because we have certain nations which are not in NATO, but uh, they are part of KFOR in uh, Kosovo. Uh, on the other hand, we have had a great success with this peace treaty in, let's say, peacemaking. But uh, I must uh, also acknowledge and admit that uh, last year was a great opportunity to implement and sign this agreement that we have uh, agreed in uh, Brussels. So there we lack a bit behind. On another register, which perhaps is the most important from your perspective, also mine, is what do we do on the ground? Not the political and security and defense and uh, system level for peace, but what we do in a uh, communitarian level. In Kosovo, I could say that we do not really have ethnic divisions or religious antagonisms. We have more of a language barrier. We have come to the point where I, not being that young anymore, am the last generation who speaks Serbian. So it's very important uh, to have more people speaking each other's languages. More Albanians speaking Serbian, Croat, Bosniak, which is more or less the same language, and more Serbs being able to communicate in Albania. Uh, I don't think we are meant to speak only one language or to live only in one place. Therefore, part of peacekeeping and peacemaking should be, in our case especially, multilinguisticism. I believe in multi-ethnicity and multiculturalism, where the key ingredient is multilinguisticism. And as one social psychologist uh, remarked, I believe in multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity, which does not rely merely on tolerance. Tolerance is good, but we have, we need to have more than tolerance. Multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity with interaction, solidarity, sympathy and empathy with intimacy, with knowing each other, with communicating without mediator, direct communication, debates, and uh, trying to do our best not to allow that critique degenerate into uh, suspicion. In my country, this is of utter importance. How to maintain critique and debate not degenerating into polarizing polemics with mutual suspicions. So this is, I think, 
in the next few years, perhaps one of the greatest challenges where education system and in particular universities should give their contribution. Yes to critique and not to prejudices and suspicion and doubts on each other's intentions. Um, Prime Minister Kurti, is this, speak, is this yeah. speaker on? Yeah. Um, Ruth Leach, Social Sciences, Education and Social Work. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was very inspiring, very balanced, very honest, I thought. Um, you'll not be surprised that I want to focus on the education dimension, which you just mentioned. And we were so glad that you visited um, the partnership today between the two schools and that you were able to see the children playing together and working together and your attendance there was much valued by them, the teachers and indeed ourselves. So I mean my question is, and I've been to Pristina on a number of occasions through the Centre for Shared Education and met colleagues there and it is, as you said, you know, a country that is really becoming vibrant again in all its dimensions. However, I want to ask you about why you think that the education system has continued to be separate, separated, and what have been the challenges in terms of addressing this? And maybe you've men mentioned one issue, which is perhaps the language issue, but also if I could follow up with that. Do you think on the basis of what you saw today and what you know from your own situation, is there a political will or a political readiness maybe to address that issue? and move forward in a positive direction, given its value to social cohesion? I was amazed uh, today in the morning uh, just uh, watching all these pupils, these children of different backgrounds playing together and being together. So a kind of togetherness of being while uh, playing, but at the same time, a certain uh, collaboration, a spontaneous one, uh, which uh, made them uh, look so, uh, like, uh, optimistic in a way that the one who witnesses that optimism also gets infected by it, you know, kind of optimism which uh, is shared without being uh, part of any kind of deliberation to be optimistic. Because we in politics, we are optimistic because we also want others to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. Whereas these children, you know, they made us all optimistic, perhaps even enthusiastic without really wanting to have that. It was a consequence, not a goal. And, and I, th I found that Fascinating. Uh, we need to do that in Kosovo as well. More funds are needed because that education must be uh, nurtured, protected, and qualitative. So more funds are needed. Then we have to make sure that some of our best students, when they graduate, they have incentives to stay within the education system. I know that it's very attractive to go to private sector, but we have, like, uh, tech sector, for example, is blooming in Kosovo, and not only. But it's very good to keep them within the uh, education system as much as uh, we can. I think that is uh, also important, and both integrated education and shared education have a lot of lessons to be learned and to be applied elsewhere. Of course, you cannot do copy-paste, but on the other hand, uh, you can uh, also adjust uh, the bulk of it to your uh, domestic uh, local uh, circumstances. And uh, uh, as you said, not just learning together, but also working and playing together. Uh, people seeing the results of collaboration, but uh, at the same time uh, experiencing this 
joyfulness, with the flavor of self-sufficiency out of togetherness. So that's what I witnessed today when I joined them in one of their games. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I can be heard, yeah? Yes. Uh, firstly, I want to say thank you very much to Prime Minister Kurti being here. I want to thank you as well to Queen's University for bringing uh, Prime Minister Kurti here, to Secretary of State, which with those warm and great words, to, to Ambassador of UK in Kosovo for, for being present in here. Uh, actually, uh, to introduce myself, uh, I am from Kosovo. Uh, I'm graduate from Queen's in international relations. Uh, I'm British, Kosovo, as well as I became uh, lots of Irishness in me, so <laughs> <laughs> lots of identities, yeah. And uh, to introduce further, actually, I was one of main co-founders of Students' Union uh, in Kosovo in 1988, so there is other members here who were active actually, yeah, which they can talk uh, themselves, yeah. Uh, uh, for, for myself, the uh, challenge when I was studying at Queen's was to explain how Kosovo came about, you know, just on the scene, like it came from nowhere. Uh, and I had to explain that actually Kosovo existed a long time and uh, uh, it came into scene because uh, we fought for democratic changes in 1990s and the uh, Western values like freedom, democracy, free elections, uh, equality, those were their main values. But in, in contrast, Serbia implemented uh, uh, apartheid policies, closed universities, as we know, yeah, we had to organize uh, uh, in private uh, houses, uh, universities, secondary schools, primary schools. So, uh, but uh, uh, we were talking about hopes. I have three identities. Uh, <laughs> oh. So, how how hopeful we are? Uh, I know this were our values in, in 1990s. How hopeful we are to see. Uh, all Kosovo nationals to feel similar to me, uh, actually with love for, for Britishness, for Kosovo, for Irishness, which is great. Thank you. Well, here we have an example of a Kosovo citizen, Kosovo Albanian, who came here, became British citizen as well, managed to become Irish as well. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, this shows perhaps the path that could be pursued in the sense that, of course, every individual is born in a certain family, usually, generally, uh, of specific uh, nationality, language, customs, lullabies, religion, and so on and so forth. But as we grow up through our upbringing and in our adolescence, each one of us has uh, uh, certain challenges in the society and those that come with critical thinking. Namely that you cannot just be one thing all your life. Human beings are not that linear, one dimension. So out of insufficiency of being only Kosovar Albanian, he became British, also Irish. Actually, he's becoming human being, so to speak, in the plane of universality. Because when we are born, we are quite particular. 
I know that in one level, there is nothing more universal than babies. But in a certain socio-political and historical context, when we are born, we are quite particular. In terms of family, place where we are born, our first citizenship, mother tongue, and so on and so forth. So, with life growing, we actually get closer to universal plane of human beings. Out of insufficiency of being only one identity throughout our life. So, I think it is worth of trying to become ever more than what we are. And this is a humanist project towards universality of human beings. Uh, so the lady um, with the dark hair. Hi, so we started with Albanians from Kosovo, so I'll continue. <laughs> I'm from Kosovo as well, and I've lived in Northern Ireland for quite a while now. And incidentally, my PhD was in Kosovo State Building here from Queen's University. And actually, I had the opportunity to interview you for my PhD in Kosovo before you became a prime minister. Um, I wanted to go back maybe to what actually go back to the basics and you talked about fundamental rights um, and then you talked about the challenges of state building. I just wanted to ask you about something that is um, boiling in Kosovo at the moment uh, regarding the civil code and I want to know why has the chair of the uh, Parliamentary Commission for Human Rights not been sacked yet? Maybe you want to explain to the room what I'm talking about. Thank you. <laughs> this was not completely fair. <laughs> where I have also to make a question to myself now. Um, the 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 matter uh, of civil code is like vast. However, certain uh, uh, conservative religious members of parliament did not want uh, our generally liberal approach for uh, civil code, uh, especially in relation to LGBTIQ plus uh, community. And uh, for a few votes, our government did not manage to pass in the parliament uh, civic code. We are going to try again and again until we succeed. One of the MPs who voted against, it is true that chairs of the uh, Parliamentarian Committee on Human Rights, which is a paradox, but then again, I am prime minister that cannot intrude in the legislative branch. It is uh, up to civil society, people of Kosovo, parliament itself, to do the necessary uh, changing. And uh, to be honest, it's not uh, that it's not known what we think of this uh, uh, member of parliament chairing this uh, parliamentary committee, but to produce the change is not up to executive branch. Sorry, maybe I should have explained myself. I do not, I, I never want you to actually intervene. I would be very happy to, you know, keep the separation of powers. The only reason why I asked you is because you do have the majority in Parliament and the head of the House Speaker is from your political party. That was the only reason why I asked. Okay? Uh, I have majority, but not for this issue. Unfortunately, I was elected with uh, 67 votes of our parliament out of 120 members of parliament. But uh, for civic code, we have in between 50 and 55 members of parliament. We don't have 61. 
if we would have 61, you wouldn't be making this question. <laughs> so any other questions? Uh, we've one here, two over here. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming uh, to talk here at Queen's today. Um, I think it can be very easy to focus on the many difficult and serious challenges that are being uh, faced both in Kosovo and in Europe as a whole. Um, so I wanted to ask a bit more of a positive question, uh, that being, what would you consider to be your biggest achievement uh, during your time as Prime Minister of Kosovo? Good question. Thank you. Well, uh, I hope that uh, our biggest achievement will be the one that we haven't achieved it yet, and that is Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, we're trying to build Sovereign Wealth Fund in Kosovo out of many years of brutal abuse and privatization. Uh, we had uh, almost two decades of, let's say, centrifugal phenomena when uh, the so-called transition from uh, socialism into capitalism uh, was done quickly without minding vision for development of the country. And with Sovereign Wealth Fund, we hope to bring together publicly owned enterprises, uh, restructure them, and save around uh, 30,000 hectares of agricultural land from ongoing not all that necessary construction. So this Sovereign Wealth Fund is something that is very dear to my heart. And second thing is uh, linking labor markets with professional education. Because we have this skills gap. Uh, and we want to make sure that for every diploma in our universities, you get a job in the market. Bridging skills gap is something that uh, we would like our government to be uh, remembered as an achievement. Otherwise, people evaluate very much the fact that uh, we eliminated corruption from public institutions at large extent, and that uh, we have had this value-based approach which became an example across the board in terms of political parties and state institutions. I was telling from early on to all our fellow activists that if you want to serve in public sector, better remain middle class. If you want to get rich, state institutions are not the place you should work. It's legitimate to seek wealth and get richer, but try your skills and knowledge and luck in business rather than in public sector as it was case uh, before. So I think this has been a great change in terms of both uh, awareness and sensitivity on one hand and uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, concrete practical engagement in democratic governance. Thank you. Um, I think we have two questions over here and one over here. Uh, good evening. Um, there are a lot of Kosovar Albanians here. I am half Northern Irish, half Kosovar Albanian as well. Uh, my family come from Mitrovica. Um, and every year when I return in the summer, I notice the difference between the north of Mitrovica, which is very much Serbian. So my question is, how does Kosovo tackle the issue of Serbian, the Serbian government still giving salaries and various um, amenities to the Serbian majority in the north? How do you strike a balance between mitigating that influence, but also not escalating conflict as well? Thank you. Uh, we have... Uh a variety of uh, ways in tackling the division in Mitrovica. Uh, one is 
by uh, having equal treatment of all citizens by our institutions, but at the same time, the universality, impersonality of rule of law as such. On the other hand, uh, I have a Serbian minister, Nenad Rashic. He has his deputy minister from Leprosavic from the north, Radovic Radomirovic, and they engage a lot in different kind of programs and projects for uh, startups, for farmers, for media and NGOs of Serbian community. And we want to encourage them to benefit by integration. Uh, Serbs in Kosovo, they are approximately 4% of the population. They have 10 reserve seats in our parliament out of 120. And the uh, Serbian language is official language all over Kosovo at every level of administration. In our country, there are 38 municipalities. 10 of them are with Serb majority. And you can turn your minority language into official municipal language if you are only 3%. In the entire Europe, there are only three municipalities where Roma language is official municipal language, and two of them are in Kosovo. Two out of three. So we are very generous in terms of minority rights because we don't want inclusion and integration via domination. Precisely, we want through accommodation and uh, uh, equality. We believe that equality integrates people, but also hearing their concerns and integrating them. Uh, Serbs in Kosovo are showing that they are afraid not of Kosovo or Albania, but of Serbia. The bullying of Belgrade, it's quite difficult to stop. But I think that in short to midterm, we will come out victorious in this struggle as well. We don't want uh, Mitrovica to become normal city in order to become Albanian, but to be equal for all the citizens in spite of their ethnicity or uh, religion. And uh, obstacles are not in ethnic differences, but in certain structures who were benefiting in the past from the absence of rule of law. Thank you. I'm particularly inspired by how your country, since gaining independence, has continued to develop its international relations with countries around the world. Um, so I was wondering, how do you continue to trust and develop these relationships with your allies, and I'm particularly pointing at the United States, when they themselves undergo governmental turmoil? When we hear threats and promises from the United States moving back towards an isolationist position, obviously this poses a risk to the stability of Europe at large, but especially countries like yours that are at risk of aggression from their neighbours. So my question is, how do you continue to develop trust, and do you feel that you can count on their support long term? Thank you. United States are our key partner, ally, and friend, in particular regarding uh, security and defense. And we are cooperating well. And uh, throughout these 25 years, whoever was in power in Washington, D.C., did not change or matter much when it comes to relation with uh, Kosovo. Uh, I don't know what the future will bring, uh, but uh, so far so good. Uh, in terms of what is going on in U.S. nowadays, I know that there are some unprecedented phenomena. However, I tend to believe that uh, American people and uh, institutions and democracy there will find strength from uh, their actuality and their tradition to face successfully current challenges. Uh, we know very well that uh, U.S. in its uh, uh, over two centuries and a half of history 
has been in some very difficult crises and turmoils, including the civil war 160 years ago. But however, they always found the power, the strength among people, with people to surpass uh, obstacles and challenges. And I think that uh, they have good chances to do it again. Uh, however, our relation with the United States is the one in which we also want to contribute. So uh, we rely on the support from the United States, but at the same time, we want to build our country from within, also in terms of security and defense, because in this way, uh, we are going to be able if not completely, at least partially, to have deterrence towards threats that uh, endanger our country. So I continue to be uh, optimistic uh, in spite of uh, some of the worries that um, have occurred with the internal uh, current state of affairs in the US. We've run 10 minutes in the UK to continue. And so the question over here. Hello, thank you for, for the talk this evening. Um, I wanted to ask, women were fundamental in the peace process in Northern Ireland and have been with maintaining stability since. What role do women play in um, state building in Kosovo? I believe that big democratic transformation and victory that came out from 2021 elections in Kosovo when we have achieved this landslide victory with over 50 percent of uh, votes was achieved thanks to three main social categories women youth and diaspora women youth and diaspora made us victorious and uh, I believe this was so because um, women were better organizing than men who remained slightly more individualistic in their approach. And at the same time, uh, women felt that finally they have this window of opportunity that shall not go in vain. Uh, the urgency of the situation, I think they understood better than anyone else. So we cannot lose another four years. This was more present among uh, women. And our parliamentary group, for example, 40% um, of members of parliament from our majority group are women. We have affirmative action. 30% of members of parliament in Kosovo's parliament must be women. But none of the women MPs of our group won thanks to quota, to affirmative action. They won thanks to the votes of the citizens. So they play a great role. And um, three out of, uh, sorry, two out of three uh, deputy prime ministers are women. Uh, five out of 15 ministers and uh, President of Republic of Kosovo is uh, Madam Vyosa Osmoni Sadriu. So, uh, democratic, progressive, positive changes on one hand, and women empowerment on the other went hand in hand uh, three years ago, and they continue to grow. Mark? Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, just by way of background, I spent a short time with K4 and Pristina in 2000, and I must say how heartened I am to hear of the progress that's been made. I mean, clearly not every military intervention achieves that degree of success, and it's really heartening to see it. Um, I would just like to ask one question, really, in terms of your consideration on the desirability, having achieved widely recognised independence, of closer integration with Albania. And if you were to go down that line, or if it was desirable, what principles should be applied generically to ensure that such integration would not endanger the peace? It's, 
it is true that humanitarian military intervention of NATO in Kosovo stands as one of the main successes of uh, North Atlantic Alliance and of international interventions in general. And I think that precisely because of this, uh, Putin is angry and nervous. Uh, he mentions Kosovo at least once a week. And in between, it's either Medvedev, Zaharova, or Lavrov, who additionally mention Kosovo in negative sense, trying to predict that Kosovo is a temporary success, because look at NATO uh, engagement in Afghanistan and Iraq, especially U.S. ones, and see what has happened. So, um, history of Kosovo and history of NATO are intertwined, and uh, we are part of each other's history. This is very important, and we want to join NATO. First milestone will be partnership for peace. Uh, in uh, relation to Albania, my mandate is jobs and justice. This is how we have achieved this victory. We are two different states. I cannot say that we are two different nations, because 93% of population in Kosovo are Albanians. However, we have 4% of Serbs who are a minority, and 3% are other minorities, Bosniak, Ashkali, Roma, Egyptian, Turks, uh, uh, and Gorani. So uh, I have to be prime minister of all, not only of uh, Albanians. Our constitution does not allow us to join another country. So, uh, uh, a referendum on creating new relation with Albania would not be constitutional. We are now focused to join EU and NATO, where Brussels is this double capital. After Russian invasion in Ukraine, it became clear to all of the Eastern Europe that nation states are not self-sufficient. We need to belong to bigger, greater alliances. So that's why uh, NATO and EU have become even more so our top priorities. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, okay, we'll take two. We'll take this one on, on the other hand. Hi, good evening, and thank you once again for meeting with us. Um, I'm an American, but I've had the good fortune to visit your beautiful country, but also Serbia. And my question uh, kind of regards the identity question that we mentioned earlier, in that I know that many Serbians view their Serbianness or their Serbian identity as being rooted in Kosovo. So how do you kind of deal with that complication as you work for greater you know, rights, equal rights, and greater respect for your nation and its, its territorial integrity. We tend to put in the center and forefront and priority what we have in common. Rule of law, democracy, political pluralism, human rights and we cherish diversity. So uh, ethnic religious differences we see as richness of our cultural heritage, uh, current situation, but also future potential. So by emphasizing what we have in common, democratic state and institutions, I think that we manage to show interest and readiness for welcoming everyone without discriminating uh, anyone. And we had one last question, I think, here. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister, again. Um, thank you very much for your visit. Um, you've talked a lot tonight about hope. 
and trying to provide hope for the people of Kosovo. And we're at the start of a year now of global elections, like probably, I think one of the largest global election years ever. When you look around when there's so much uncertainty going on, what gives you hope? First of all, fear cannot be a policy. We live at times when you have authoritarian leaders who try to scare people. But uh, hope must prevail over fear on one hand. And on the other hand, passion has to prevail over cynicism. And uh, this is something that we believe in and we turn it into action with our deeds in democratic governance. Because uh, optimism, hope is something that keeps us going. But at the same time, the people themselves, human society, is the source of this hope and optimism. I do not believe that uh, my hope as individual politician or prime minister is something that gets spread among the people. On the contrary, I am the one who takes this positivity from the people and uh, confirms it to them. So, in a way, political representatives are the vehicle of mediation, of a mediated relation that people have with themselves. We come from them for the sake of them. And it is the people that make me hopeful in order to confirm that uh, to them. And uh, I would point out to two victories again, hope over fear and uh, passion over cynicism. Passion as engagement, cynicism as distanciation. You cannot be cynical without detachment. Those who are cynical, they have already moved out from the situation. And I don't want to move out. I want to be in. And uh, this is what is politics as engagement, politics as struggle. What we fight against is authoritarian leaders who want to inflict fear, to scare people, and to render them passive so they can rule and uh, dominate. Again, this is a struggle where we also have to point out that even if you are afraid sometimes, that, can, that cannot be organizing principle for anything, and likewise not a policy that can bring us together or lead us forward. Thank you. Hope over fear and passion over cynicism, I think that's a beautiful message to end on. And I would just like to thank um, Prime Minister Curti for um, engaging so generously um, here this evening and to thank the audience as well for the very considered um, questions. I think this has been a fascinating conversation um, and I'm absolutely delighted that you've given us your time. Um, and I hope that now that you will join me to thank Prime Minister Curti just for, for being here this evening. <laughs>